Over to Code of Victoria CEO, Tina Hogarth-Clark. Thanks, Amanda, and good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Tina, and I am the CEO here at Code of Victoria, and I'd like to welcome you all to Will Australia's Aged Care System Be Fixed? Our Coda in Conversation event about the Royal Commission into Quality and Safety. On behalf of Coda Victoria, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we work, live and meet today. For me, I'm on Melbourne's Wurundjeri people land and I pay my respects to their elders past, present and those who continue the journey. I also recognise the rich Indigenous heritage and culture of our country. Today's events seek to unpack the findings of the Royal Commission, but with nine volumes of information collated over two years, this is a challenging proposition for anyone, but we look forward to our consumer advocate, Judy Grigurki, doing her best. We will then hear from academic and gerontologist, Professor Joseph Ibrahim, who will share his informed view on the appetite for political change. And then to our panel of consumer representatives, many of whom have had a really long association with COTA and our work in this Royal Commission. Thank you to those speakers and particularly the recipients of the aged care, uh, their families and carers who are on our panel today. And thanks to all of you who have joined us today for your interest and commitment to a better aged care system in Australia. This online event will be facilitated by our Seniors Rights Victoria Education Coordinator, Gary Ferguson, and with Zoom support from our IT guru and friend, Lynette Colston, who will now provide you with a brief Zoom orientation. So over to you. Thanks, Lynette. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks, Tina. Hello, everybody. Welcome. Uh, just a few things about Zoom. You're probably all quite familiar with it after about 12 months of using it. Uh, just you can have your camera on and off. It's completely up to you. But if you do want to be in the mode where you're just seeing the speaker instead of a whole heap of faces on your screen, there is an option up the top right on the computer to switch between what's called gallery view, where you've got all the faces, and to switch or to switch to speaker view so that you're just using the speaker, which can be a lot less distracting. Uh, your microphones have all been disabled. You, you can't disable them. Uh, you, sorry, you can't enable them uh, just because we've got so many people in attendance. So uh, please use the chat. There is a chat at the bottom of your screen in the bottom bar of Zoom on a computer. It's in the dot, dot, dot option on an iPad at the top right on the bottom on an iPhone. So use that chat message to ask your question, which can be to the whole group so that everyone can see it, but you can also choose to send a message to an individual as well. Uh, if you do need any tech support, if there's a problem during the session, uh, I will put my number into the chat. You can uh, give me a call, sorry, text me. If you can text me and say that you're from the CODA session and I will give you a call back uh, and to give you some assistance where needed. Uh, so I think that's all for me, unless I've missed anyone and anything out of all of that. Okay, thanks, Lynette. And just so you have that number, which is in the chat, if you get into difficulties, it's 0416 042 642. Uh, before we get underway, just a reminder that this event is being recorded. And if you don't want your image recorded during the event, please turn your cameras off. Also, just can I just, sorry, can I just pipe in there? I have actually got it. So it is just recording the speakers. So it right. is actually okay. You won't be on the recording, but you know, sometimes it's best just to turn it off. Yep. Yeah, thanks, Lynette. Um, also, um, please be respectful of each other, the guest speakers and panel members when participating in discussion and questions. If you find part of this forum upsetting, there are telephone numbers now being displayed in the chat to contact. Alternatively, don't think you have to stay. Uh, it's okay to take a break or leave the forum. And we also have a counsellor available during the forum. Her name is Janet. If you could just put up your hand, Janet, there you go. Um, and her direct line contact, Janet's from Your Community Health, her direct line contact 
is 84701874. So I'll just say that number again, 84701874. Also, if you're tweeting today, please in, add in our handles, which will be in the chat line, hashtag agedcarerc or hashtag agedcare and tag us at Coda Victoria or tag at Prof Joe online. Okay, welcome to everybody. In the first part of this forum, two speakers will present on the findings and analysis of the final report of the Royal Commission. There will be a short time for questions from the audience at the end of each presentation. You can ask questions in the chat and Amanda will be moderating the chat to pick up on any themes. In the second part of the forum, we'll hear from a panel of people who represent those most affected by the outcomes of the Royal Commission. And then at the end, there will be a summary of the forum by Amanda and Alexia. Our first speaker this morning is Judy Grigurki. Judy has extensive leadership in health, community, disability, and aged care sector management and peak body roles, and has a demonstrated passion for empowering and supporting people and representing the views and concerns of service users, consumers, and community members. Judy also has many years of personal experience as a consumer advocate in mental health and in supporting health literacy and decision-making capacity for people challenged by their engagement with the health system. She is currently enjoying consultancy and consumer advocacy roles in a variety of fields. Welcome, Judy, to the forum. Thanks very much, Gary, and thank you to Coda Victoria for asking me to be part of this amazing session. Um, Coda Victoria asks, and Tina said in the opening, Will Australia's aged care system be fixed? And further, whether outcomes from the Royal Commission's recommendations will inspire the generational change needed for our broken aged care system. In unpacking some of the Royal Commission recommendations from a consumer perspective, I will have a go at answering these questions, but I wanna say up front that I'm not sure the system can be fixed or indeed that anything from a report comprising five volumes, and I think someone said nine books because several of them have multiple um, parts and 148 recommendations. I don't know that any of that can actually inspire anything, let alone the generational change we need to fix a broken aged care system. But onto the Royal Commission. Commissioners Linnell Briggs and Tony Pigoni provided their final report, Care, Dignity and Respect, to government on the 26th of February, which if I recall was a Friday, and Prime Minister Morrison tabled the documents in Parliament on the Monday or Tuesday following. I'm pleased to say that lots of people have, uh, and their organisations, have published reviews and reports and comments on and about the report and recommendations in the six weeks since then. Uh, and they have all been helpful because I am telling you right now, I haven't read the eight or nine volumes. I've had a good scan of the summary, um, but one thing I'm not going to do today is go through all of the recommendations and that would take more than the time we've got. Um, I want to draw your attention to something I found particularly useful, which was only released over the weekend. Um, consumer groups uh, produced a joint statement, um, 12 aged care consumer organisations, and that joint statement proposes some actions to be taken. Um, and I think on Monday as well, um, Provider Peaks also produced a more detailed 15 point plan than what they'd released before. So there's a lot of information out there. Um, I have promised Amanda I will provide something in writing and I'll make sure links to some of those key documents will be in um, my notes that I provide. So 
I want to start off really with a statement from the commissioners. They articulated their purpose for a new aged care system, that it should deliver an entitlement to high quality care and support for older people and to ensure they receive it. The care and support must be safe and timely and must assist older people to live an active, self-determined and meaningful life in a safe and caring environment that allows for dignified living in old age. Sounds pretty good to me. Can we get there, I think, is the real question. Um, and I'm not, I could spend my whole time just talking about uh, that. Uh, I want to refer quickly to what some other people have said from those comments, and particularly Stephen Duckett from the um, Grattan Institute, who wrote that if the major recommendations are adopted, Australia will get a transformed aged care system over the next five years. Um, and he gave just a few top um, highlights of what he thought the four key takeaway messages are a rights-based system, um, a system with stronger governance, improved workforce conditions and capability, and a note that a better system will cost more. Um, a lot of the other commentary I've noted has been about workforce, and I can't go into that in too much detail, but indeed, um, the Health Services Union had uh, Jared Hayes has said that um, we have to get remuneration right. And if uh, the government doesn't get remuneration and worker conditions right, we won't have the workforce at all to deliver this new system that we hope and believe might be the outcome of the Royal Commission. Um, there was also a concern raised by Professor Denise Jepson, the chair of Macquarie University's Aging and Aged Care Researchers Network. And Denise is concerned about things like a, a proposed registration system for personal care workers and minimum qualifications as possibly being barriers, not just for new people entering the system, but also potentially for um, uh, those who are in the system now and who might have a burden of needing to do more qualifications. I think, though, she did raise in her commentary the fact that whatever we do, the reform of the workforce, remuneration and conditions and so on, should be both sector-wide and bipartisan. I think that's something we need to take on board from a consumer perspective, I think one of the strongest responses to the uh, report recommendations um, has been from Coda Australia, our um, national body of which uh, Coda Victoria is part. Um, Coda Australia Chief Executive Ian Yates highlighted that there is no dignity in aged care without control. He identified that the recommendations lack a strong enough focus on choice and control and went on to say, if quality of life is the goal of our aged care system, then it needs to be on our terms. That means seeing older people as full partners in the delivery of their own care and allowing them to make the decisions that work for them. Who bathes them when they get up, when they eat, more importantly, who they see and when, something that was particularly relevant in the COVID era. era sorry. So broadly, consumer perspectives on the Royal Commission and its findings. Consumer concerns about the Commission findings have been flagged right through from the end of last year when Council Assisting put forward uh, their recommendations. We can't be clear yet how effectively any recommendations will provide concerns, um, sorry, solutions to these concerns, but the kinds of things that have been raised by consumers and consumer bodies um, are things like uh, insufficient evidence or emphasis on consumer empowerment, choice and control as a key aspect of this reform. 
the fact that care finders and case managers have not been independent from government, even though at some point there was an intention they were, and so they can't fully act on behalf of consumers when they're tied to provider interests. We know that consumers are concerned about full transparency and accountability of service performance. And we're not seeing that or the cost of implementing that. Confusion remains for consumers regarding the policy rationale and direction for things like system governance, which is one of the parts of the system that the commissioners proposed. We also see there's a failure to address a sustainable way forward on financing. And um, just to make it clear that there are some parts of the report and rec recommendations where the two commissioners didn't agree. So things like fin funding and finance and also uh, the possible structure of the new system would be um, things that there are divergent options on in the report and that government will yet have to make a decision about. Um, we also see that there's been insufficient priority given to enhancing control for older people and their families, particularly in residential care, and that involves uh, bed licence. So the, the, um, the next step really in a breakdown of provider control shifting to consumer control was the release of bed licenses into the hands of consumers. Um, one of the things I've been doing in my consulting time is actually volunteering on the Services Australia Aged Care Task Force, which has been looking at all the aged care forms and processes through Centrelink. And I've heard a lot of comment and seen the evidence of the complexity of the aged care system as we face it now. Over the past week since the release of the report, the most common thing I've heard from consumers has not been about detailed recommendations, has not been about the specifics of the report, but is really about how to achieve this generational change we want to need. The size of this task is daunting not just for us, but for government providers and workers, but even more so for individual consumers. So how do we go about influencing the answers? As individuals with a commitment to better aged care, as consumers and stakeholders collectively, what can we do to help fix Australia's aged care system? Can we, individually and collectively, together be the inspiration to bring about generational change. The joint statement uh, that I've referred to from the 12 Age Care Consumer Organisations, which was released on Sunday, um, and I'll put the link in my notes, uh, it, it is available on Coda Australia's website. Uh, the organisations, uh, the Association of Independent Retirees, Carers Australia, COTA Australia, Dementia Australia, Elder Abuse Action Australia, FECA, Legacy Australia, LBTIQ Plus Health Australia, National Seniors Australia, the Older Persons Advocacy Network, the PICAC Alliance and the Returned and Services League of Australia. So it's a very broad group representing a huge number of Australian aged care consumers and older people. The purpose of their joint statement was to provide a clear unified voice to government. It's inclusive of the views of current and future older people who are using aged care, including those who face barriers to access. The statement conveys the signatory's expectations of government in advance of its budget and comprehensive response to the Royal Commission. In broad terms, the statement seeks to highlight key items that must be acted upon in the 2021-22 federal budget, as well as items that require further consideration beyond that timing. So the clear action steps that the joint statement puts forward, there are 10 key asks um, and they have multiple recommendations or 
um, start with an ask, start followed by a consumer statement, and then go on to explain what older people want. So for example, um, the first ask is a better aged care act, which again is one of the major recommendations. What do consumers want? A better aged care act that is designed to uphold human rights, to ensure consumer choice and control, containing stronger protections for consumers and better accountability of aged care providers with tiered enforcement measures and penalties. So we won't go through them all, there's just no time. The other consumer focused actions and asks are proper recognition and support for the role of informal carers, something that we've been advocating for for many years. Uh, easy to understand information and local solutions. Services that are inclusive, culturally safe and sensitive. And better integration of other health and wellbeing services with aged care. So if all those things are addressed, we will see the required change in the next uh, and subsequent financial years. I do want to highlight though um, a surprise that I found in that joint statement, um, which links back to the recommendations. That is, there's a diagram, which I'm just going to hold in front of my camera so you can see it, might be back to front. You'll know what you're looking at when you see that multicolored thing. And that's a diagram of the proposed structure or the recommended structure that these 12 consumer organisations have proposed. And in that, there are two things that caught my eye, implementation task force and a council of elders. Council of elders, very small print says underneath, must include lived experience voices. And the chair of that Council of Elders would be a member of the Implementation Task Force sitting under um, the government structure. I've spent nearly 10 years working in peak bodies that have a focus on ageing and aged care, including those that represent providers and consumers. This is the first time I can recall that we've come close to having a governance model that includes people who are actual users of aged care services and potentially family members and carers of people receiving services as active participants in the governance model. So for me, this is groundbreaking. I believe that our consumer peaks and advocacy groups like these 12 signatories like Code of Victoria in bringing you the conversation today, doing a fantastic job. But somehow this feels different. Is this our chance, not just to fix the aged care system, but to use this opportunity to have voices at the table, indeed voices at multiple tables, to inspire the generational change we need? Um, uh, a quote from the launch of the statement over the weekend from National Seniors Australia CEO, Professor John McCullum. Much can be achieved in the next year to give older Australians genuine self-determination, to hold providers accountable for failure to deliver quality care, to treat those who need support with dignity and respect, and to enable and reward excellence certainly agree with that. Ian Yates, Chief Executive of Coda Australia, followed up by adding, we recognise the government faces significant challenges in implementing the Royal Commission's recommendations in full, including the need for major budget funding and a major increase in workforce. But these challenges must be met. This is Australia's line in the sand moment for giving us the aged care system that we need and expect. I couldn't find an inspiring or positive quote from the commissioners, so I'm using another one of Ian Yates. In the Daily Telegraph on Monday, he said, a new aged care system must tip 
scales towards the individual and give older people genuine self-determination. That means control over the culture, choice of care and service delivery, and full transparency from providers. Protecting the dignity of older Australians, it is not just a moral imperative. We should build an aged care system that we will one day be content to live in. So, will Australia's aged care system be fixed? According to our expert commentators, it can be if the federal budget on the 11th of May and the government's response to the Royal Commission due by the end of May provide commitment to the investment required over the, this budget and the forward estimates to achieve that purpose set out by the commissioners, to deliver an entitlement to high quality care and support for older people and to ensure they receive it. Care and support must be safe and timely and must assist older people to live an active, self-determined and meaningful life in a safe and caring environment that allows for dignified living in old age. Let's hope we get there. Back to you, Gary. Thanks, Judy. Um, and, uh... Thanks for summarising uh, the nine volumes into 20 minutes, which is quite an achievement. Although I do note that at the beginning you said you went um, across the nine volumes, which I'm a bit surprised about, but um, neither am I. And um, thank you for focusing on some of those issues, uh, such as transparency and the rights-based approach and the training of the workforce and so on. I suppose from my perspective, uh, one of the things that you did sort of focus on um, predominantly was this notion of self-determination. And I suppose what one of the questions I have, um, especially with the uh, recommendation for the establishment of a council of elders, is how does an individual who's resident in an aged care home have input into that sort of uh, level um, and how do we actually make self-determination part of the culture of aged care homes so that there's not repercussions for people when they do have input? I, I think it's evident that it, what we've seen with this move to online um, engagement over the last year, that there is actually more opportunity for people who are residents in um, aged care homes who are in their own homes but struggle to be out and about, um, that there is more opportunity to be engaged. I know Mel Mitchell's an apology for today, but we've seen what a powerful advocate she was uh, in the Royal Commission itself. And I'm on a number of uh, advisory groups and panels as a consumer advocate for the Australian Digital Health Agency. And uh, I would say all of the ones focused on ageing and aged care, and there are several at the moment, have people who are residents in various settings, aged care settings um, and uh, small home models who are able uh, by virtue of an iPad to be able to participate. Mm -hmm. I think the real challenge, and, and it's something I struggle with as a consumer advocate, is that we come as individuals and we know our, you know, this thing about self-determination is that with, you know, 86 people on this call, we're all different. Our needs are going to be different. Our preferences are going yes. to be different. Our choices are going to be different. I remember when my mum was facing um, the need for a level of care, she didn't want choice and control. While I was out there advocating for it, she wanted to be looked after. Yes. And that's just as valid a choice as people like me fighting um, for me, fighting for my cousin in Adelaide who needs care at home and can't get it. Yes. <laughs> So um, I'm, I'm hopeful, Gary, that we can uh, make life easier, um, that at this system level, 
that we have some voices. We know that a representative can't represent everyone's voice, yes. but they can use their lived experience to convey that the diversity that we see and the fact that self-determination as a in the purpose statement, self-determination as a goal of the system can only be achieved if real people with real experience of how systems work are at those tables, not just one table, but all of the tables. Yes, I agree, I agree. All right, um, we might move on to the next speaker now. Thank you, Judy. Um, our second speaker is Joseph Ibrahim, who is a medical specialist in geriatrics and an academic professor and head of the Health Law and Aging Research Unit at the Department of Forensic Medicine, Monash University. Joseph has 30 years of clinical experience as a doctor in the public hospital system, providing care for older people. He brings that knowledge and insights to research work. Joseph's research team focuses on reducing harm to older persons from neglect, poor care and abuse as well as seeking to improve the quality of life for older people. Joseph has also been an expert witness for criminal and coroner's court cases, as well as the Royal Commission into Aged Care, Quality and Safety. Welcome, Joe. Hello, Joseph, you're on mute. mute. Your microphone's off. I'm mute. Sorry, is that better? Apologies for the false start. Um, thanks very much, Gary. I'm uh, pleased to be here and have got the stopwatch on, so I stay within my 15 minutes. I want to start. Uh, so my my talk's going to be a bit glum, I think, in the end, because I'm going to say why things can't happen. But I really want to start with uh, an affirmation that we have the technical knowledge, the capability, and the wealth in this country to have a far better aged care system. So no one listening today should be in any doubt that we can do much, much better. And it really is to do with the will. It's not that we don't have the resources or we don't have the knowledge or we don't have the capability. All of that exists. It's just we haven't harnessed it and we haven't harnessed it together. My reading of the, the Royal Commission, um, I think, and I'll come to that in a little bit more detail, um, is that the political appetite for change is incredibly low. Um, having said that, we also need to recognise that as low as the appetite is now, it's probably the highest it's ever been in the last 50 years. So this can't be an opportunity that we miss. We've got to transform that low appetite for change at the political level into real change. Otherwise, um, those opportunities aren't going to occur in our lifetime. Why do I say the political appetite is low? Well, we have past history. And although past doesn't determine the future, we've had over 20 inquiries into aged care in the last two decades. So it's multiple governments, multiple ministers, um, different flavours of um, government and political parties have failed to act. And so this isn't um, happenstance or chance. And one of the disappointing things for me with the Royal Commission is they didn't get down to the root cause of why there had been inaction on 20 separate inquiries. And to me, this goes to a major failing within the, the bureaucracy and the relationship between um, the bureaucracy and the ministers and the uh, cabinet. There's been too much reliance on our business model and assuming that the market will regulate aged care and it was never going to regulate aged care from when the Act was determined in 1997. And most people in government do not see it as their job and we see that by the appointment of a junior minister if a minister's employed. Um, in the role for aged care. So we've had 20 years of inaction and 20 years of um, avoiding um, the issue with no real consequence. No one's lost government because of poor aged care. No one's actually really lost their ministry because of failings in aged care. Um, and we saw that again with COVID. So there is no internal impetus in government to act. 
if we now look at behaviours around what could be done around knowledge that exists and comes to the department um, without too much effort, the Serious Incident Reporting Scheme, which requires reporting of sexual assault, physical assault, the federal department's been collecting since um, 2007 and have done nothing with that information to improve aged care or address systematic change at a national level. And that's the data they've asked for that comes to them. The regulator now has that role and be interesting to see whether they do anything with it. But again, I don't believe they're equipped to deal with that type of work. The coroner's investigations of premature and preventable deaths have been ongoing since 2000 or since the court existed. And we regularly present cases every quarter to the sector on lessons learned from coronial investigations into deaths. The health department has not used these, they're not propagated nationally, and they don't um, act on themes that continually recur. So even when they're handed information about poor care, they still don't do anything with it, even when the solutions are provided through the court. The Royal Commission has done itself a disservice. Um, so the two commissioners have disagreed. Um, and so this now gives the government a legitimate out. And so do they, they now have a third option of saying, well, both disagreed, this is too hard, we send it back to be looked at or we have chosen a, a, a third pathway. The discordance was unnecessary because I don't believe the commissioners disagreed on the principle they wanted addressed, but they disagreed on how it might be done. And I think we would have been far better off if they had um, spoken about transparency with regards to the finances and accountability, and also that the need for a governance structure that is actually engaged with and acting on behalf of older people. And so that the Commissioner Pagoni has asked for a separate organisation to lead aged care and Commissioner Briggs has asked us to forgive the health department and give them a second chance. Both have been, uh, uh, both recommendations, I believe, come from their own lived experience about how things get done. The other issue, apart from the discordance, is there's 148 recommendations. Uh, do all of the 148 need to be implemented? Are some more important than others? Are some dependent on others to be done? And so there's no information here about. Um, you know, let's say recommendation 50 can only work if you've actually put in place recommendations 1 to 15 and 20. So there's no, I think, um, real tale about how those um, recommendations intersect. And in a sense, what we've got is a smorgasbord that delivers something for everyone, but potentially nothing for the system as a whole. I think the most egregious failing has been the lack of a consumer guide. Um, the Aged Care Commission was set up in a different model to every other Royal Commission in the past. So Commissioner Briggs is not a lawyer. It was set up to a look at aspirational rather than investigate the causes of failure. And I think not addressing the causes of failure is a, remains an issue. Um, but failing to deliver a consumer guide. So the Royal Commission was meant to be acting on behalf of older Australians. And there is no guide that I am aware of that tells older Australians, this is what the Commission found, this is what it means for you. And this is a explainer. And they should have done that and they're able to do that. Other things that could have been done that haven't been done is restrictive practice, guidelines about restrictive practice and eliminating restraint have existed since the early 2000s. It remains a problem 20 years on. The young people in nursing homes issue, a Senate inquiry from 2005 saying it wasn't acceptable to have young people living in nursing homes and this should be solved. Nothing happened in that space for almost 13 years until the Royal Commission asked the department what were they doing about the Senate inquiry. Um, so that hasn't changed. 
the easy fix of home care packages has dragged on and on and on and doesn't need a Royal Commission to say if people are waiting for care that this should be fixed. So there's your history of nothing happening despite it all being there. The Prime Minister's um, press conference immediately after the release of the Royal Commission, noting that he had the findings for two and a half days, he holds a press conference just before he tables the document and you can't access the document till after he's finished his press conference and there's not been any revisiting of that, shows that he really didn't want to address the issue. If you go back and review that, that he says words like, this is complex, this is hard, it's going to be expensive, it takes time. So in the language of politicians, taking time means we're probably not going to do anything. Expensive means that do you want me to raise your taxes? And I'm sure you don't. So you're going to be on my side when we don't spend so much. And it's complex and hard is, is not actually true. It's not complex and hard. It's no more complex. Uh, it, the, the complexity is not beyond our capability of um, a modern contemporary society with the knowledge that we have in 2021. It is not complex. It just going to take a bit of um, hard work. It's going to take hard work to do it and dedication, but it's not um, complex in the sense that it can't be done. The other issue is that the federal government again played their smoke and mirrors game with the Prime Minister announcing $450 million being released um, alongside the Royal Commission's meeting. And anyone who wasn't listening carefully might have thought that this money was intended as a response to the Royal Commission. In fact, $270 million was allocated to the aged care providers to keep them operational till the end of June. So none of that money really or was dedicated to implementing anything from the Royal Commission. So the Journalists really didn't pick up on that, haven't pursued that, that issue at all. The question now is why should the government act? What's in it for them? Do they get votes? They don't get votes from the 200,000 residents. Most of the residents um, in aged care centres often don't vote or are discouraged from voting, are unlikely to be in swinging seats or their votes which are spread over 2,700 facilities as a um, collective won't impact. So the votes of the individuals doesn't matter. In terms of accountability, this is really a federal government issue. Almost every other issue we have the states or the community come in swinging with a seat at the table. The states don't want a seat at the table and you would have seen the argy-bargy between Victoria and the federal around COVID, how each was trying to say, not my job. They didn't really in the end say, I will take responsibility and make sure it gets done. There's no bi bipartisanship around aged care. There is in other areas, but not in aged care. Um, the cost, and it will cost money, but even if we double the amount of money needed, it's still going to be only um, one to 2% of GDP, which we can afford. So there's nothing in it for the government. There's no votes. They're going to have to increase taxes or spend on something else. What's in it for the taxpayer? And here is, if you ask people, where would you rather spend $1,000 on a young person or an old person, it'll always be spent on the younger person. Do you want to spend the money on a healthy person or, or on aged care? You want to spend it on health care. Do we want the Olympics or do we want um, slightly better um, gravy for people in residential aged care? The vast majority of people are young, able-bodied and young, young people and able-bodied people, including able-bodied older people, want services that help them not the people that they don't identify with. 
I'm just really aware of the time and racing through this. What's politically doable is a new act, a new regulator, new standards, um, new items for payment to allied health and uh, clinical professionals. And they're in the um, recommendations. What's going to be hard to do is the increasing salaries for staff and making sure that money stays with the staff and doesn't go to the provider. And that the medical input is actually a co-share arrangement uh, where there is a shared care model for older people. And I think what the Royal Commission has provided is when you strip it down, it reads as more money for more people will lead to a better system. Um, whereas what we know in healthcare is more people doesn't lead to a better system. Better transparency, better accountability, better teamwork and a greater level of empathy into what you're doing is what makes a system better. And so I think it's those things that um, are needed Success in advocacy, and one of the things that we need to remember here is that the civil rights, the feminist movement, HIV, um, breast cancer management all improved because people that were directly affected came with their personal story, which made the community empathise and identify, and they made a stand and said they weren't going away. And we see this now with Grace Tame in particular, who has given voice to um, you know egregious acts of the past and it's clear that grace is not going away and so the government now has to deal with a problem that has been present um, yeah for a millennia and it's because grace tame is able to get people to engage with what happened to her and she has the fortitude and the guts to, to be clear that she's not going anywhere and this problem must be dealt with. You can't be fobbed off. The Council of the Elders is a small step and I think a very, very small step towards having advocacy. And my biggest concern is that the Council of the Elders, which is really the only consumer-based um, action in those recommendations, people will put a tick next to it and say it's done when I say how will 10 people represent 200,000 with all their different needs and will we only end up with able-bodied cognitively intact middle-class people who have the capability to apply to be on this council of the elders and so we we really haven't changed the system I'm so I might just get you to um, round it off because we're racing yep. in terms of time. Sorry, Greg. So I, I just want to reiterate that Australia is one of the five or ten wealthiest countries in the world. If we were to double the amount of money going to aged care, we'd increase that from 1% to 2% of GDP. We have the technical knowledge in medicine, nursing, personal care, aged care. We have all of that. We have the knowledge in terms of human rights law, laws around accountability, transparency. <clears throat> all of this exists. What's missing is the will to act. And I think it's now up to us to really force that. Um, if we miss this opportunity, it's not going to come back. Great. Thank you very much, Joe. And um, uh, I think one of the things that you raised is, uh, particularly at the beginning, I mean, you precursed your speech by saying that this is going to be pretty glum, um, and it probably is pretty glum, but um, some of the comments in, in the chat have been that, you know, you're stating what is the reality. And uh, there have been some other comments around, I suppose, uh, you know, even though there are 2,700 facilities spread across the country with older people in them, which dilutes the vote and therefore doesn't have the uh, power to change government. There's a whole lot of people, um, which has been commented on in the chat, that are connected to those people in those aged care facilities that expand the power of the vote. And 
I suppose what I'd ask you is, you know, one of the things I heard you speak yesterday was you, you used a metaphor of the diamond on the drill and uh, how we actually get people to a point where they're affecting change at an individual level. I, I think that... <clears throat> I think you need to, to be highly active. And I think that we, we no longer live in a world where you can trust people in authority. Yeah. And, and it turns out that we should never have trusted people in authority. Um, so we need to be remain vigilant and we need to go back to what it means to be a, a member of society, a member of the community and a taxpayer is we have rights. And if we fail to exercise them, then they will be ignored. I think one of the things I would have liked to have seen is that the 200,000 residents um, are a separate, um, and I don't know how you do this, but they, they would have two seats in parliament. So you pull those 200,000 people together and you say they have two seats in parliament that they can vote on because that's roughly the, the area um, for each electorate. If you really wanted to... Um, shake loose some of the thinking but as I said that we are if we do nothing then nothing will happen yeah. because th there's no reason to do that and you have to remember and I got into trouble for this is that people in our position that are well educated financially well off can speak up often don't need the aged care system as much as people um, that aren't so fortunate. And so we tend not to worry about it so much because we think we're going to be okay or we'll navigate it. But it's that's not the case when you're older and dependent. You lose your autonomy and you lose your ability to speak up. The minute you depend on someone, you, you, you struggle to speak up no matter who you are and I still remember I, I looked after a Supreme Court judge when I was an intern and the Supreme Court judge was powerless for to a 23 year old junior doctor because of the dynamic that we were in um, and that person was dependent on the team and dependent on me as the junior doctor on the team to do what was needed um, so he wasn't telling me off. He wasn't giving instructions. And that stayed with me my entire career about you may be incredibly powerful in your role in the community, but the minute you have a health issue or a, a dependency issue, the scales completely flip. Yeah. And yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, there have been a few more comments in the uh, chat. And I'll just uh, read one of these out um, from Kim. Important message about the Council of the Elders, how to ensure that the voices of people with cognitive communication difficulties also get heard. Many of those people can't, won't be able to read information about applying for such a role, let alone be able to participate without appropriate support. This is a high number of people in aged care. Speaking only to carers is not okay. Thanks for raising this. Professor Joe. And with that, what I might do is move now into the panel Q&A section of the forum. And in this part of the forum, we've invited some people, consumers, to contribute to the discussion about the final report and looking forward. Before introducing them, I just wanted to make a few points to give some further context uh, for this part of the discussion. 1.3 million people access the Australian aged care system. 184,000 people live in aged care homes, sometimes called residential aged care facilities. 142,500 older Australians receive a home care package. Over 50% of older people accessing aged care have one or more attributes that place them in a diverse or marginalised needs grouping such as being from a culturally and linguistically diverse background, living with a disability, or being from the LGBTIQ community. 16% of uh, people in that group of uh, the number of people seeking aged care were homeless at the age of 55 years of age. And 70% of people in Australia with dementia 
lived in the community in 2016. From this data, it's important to recognise that in all of this, and the previous two speakers have also raised this, the voices of older people and consumers are very important. Code of Victoria has set up this panel discussion to provide an opportunity to hear from those most affected. We hope that there are more opportunities in the future to hear their voices. So let me introduce the panel members to you. Nick Nicolau comes from a Macedonian background and his mother was in St. Basil's until she died some years ago before COVID. During his mother's residency, Nick visited every day for five years before her death and interacted with other residents. Nick also speaks Greek. Robin Boat lives in Preston and has been involved in aged care through her life as a provider in policy development, project and project management, and is currently a fierce advocate. Peter Wilcox has lived an experience, has lived, has a lived experience of disability since he was four years old. He worked in a small to medium business management before his retirement. He also has an extensive volunteer history in aged care and disability. He's a passionate advocate for people to maintain their independence and have the right to make their own decisions and choices. Karen Abanka has worked in various programs and projects to support older people's rights and independence. She currently coordinates the Aged Care Navigators Program at Code of Victoria and has worked at Code of Victoria for 18 years. And finally, Ruth Hosking is a home care recip recipient, Aged Care Navigators volunteer, lobbyist, and carer partner of her husband, who is a World War II veteran. Ruth lives in Bendigo, and during the recent COVID crisis, she made herself available on the telephone to assist people navigating the aged care system. Before we begin with the panel, I'd like to also attend an apology from Merle Mitchell, who can't attend today because of illness. Merle is an aged care home resident in Glen Waverley and has had former roles with the Australian and Victorian Council of Social Services. Merle was a powerful witness at the Royal Commission hearings. Her submission can be viewed on the Commission's website. We wish her well. Okay, um, again, just a reminder that during the discussion, you can make comments or questions in the chat. From time to time, we'll be uh, looking at those comments and giving a summary or asking questions of the panel. To open with, what I'd like to do is ask each of the panel members uh, briefly, if they can, within your personal context or role, can you identify one aspect of the Royal Commission's final report that will lead to better outcomes for older people? Who would like to start? Nick. Might just take you off mute, Nick. There you go. Okay, okay. yeah, good. Uh, uh, a most pressing um, issue for me has been chemical restraint. And uh, if uh, uh, staff numbers, and I'm um, certain that chemical restraint <clears throat> uh, with over medication was used to deal with uh, understaffing. <laughs> I'm sorry, and increasing uh, uh, the the numbers of staff um, in a manner where people, instead of being uh, over medicated to uh, be kept quiet, um, they would be taken for a walk during the day, on a nice day at least, uh, that, that it's not raining. I often visited uh, the nursing home that I, uh, that my mother was in and uh, I would ask people on a brilliant sunny day, did you go for a walk today? And they would always say to me, no, we, we don't go for walks. Uh, they just sat by the television uh, with the appearance of a hangover on their face. 
and and it was uh, all too obvious that they uh, um, been uh, uh, over medicated, and of course that uh, other familiar feature of uh, uh, their beam was the exceptionally loud volume on the television that they all sitting around, uh, which was designed to drown any requests for help. Um, so uh, for me, uh, if I had to single out one item that I think will make a difference with uh, an increase in uh, staff in uh, numbers would be uh, chemical restraint. Great, thanks very much, Nick. I think that's very important. And certainly uh, the commission has looked at uh, the workforce, not only just in the uh, training of the workforce or upskilling of the workforce, but also the, the staff to uh, resident ratios. Um, any of the other panel members? It's very difficult for me to see um, on the screen, but um, just yell out if the panel members are there uh, and Peter, want to make Peter a comment. Wilcox. Peter Wilcox. Peter Wilcox, yeah. Yeah, um, I, I live with disabilities and we've got the, the, the two things happening concurrently. Um, I'm a power chair user and uh, um, I live in a fully accessible home. And the one thing that I think has been addressed and recognised is that we need to provide better assistance for people in their homes. Um, I don't think the modelling that I'm hearing is, is, is what I'm looking for uh, because um, I meant to grab this before, but I've got a lever arch folder that thick, which is a paperwork from my service provider for this year alone. Now, I, it's, it's overwhelming. I'm uh, still alert enough to be able to compre uh, comprehend this, but to negotiate it is incredibly hard. I know that my partner would struggle with it. I know that my uh, children would um, tick a box rather th than try and understand what's happening yes. here. Um, and that concerns me immensely. So. But the one thing that I would say that's come out of this Royal Commission and it's happening now, which is great, is that we're aware that we've got a system that is wrong, it is broken, it is cruel, it has not been addressed, and these recommendations are not going to happen, so we need to do something about it. I was involved with the Productivity Commission into Disability. I saw um, the NDIS start, I saw it driven by David Bowen, and I saw the energy that David put into ensuring that people were heard and things happen. We need no less than that. Um, I don't know how we're gonna get it, but we do need a senior executive driving this and driving it well with passion. Um, without it, we're, we're gonna end up in exactly the same situation we are. Yeah, okay, thanks, Peter. Um, Ruth or Robin, do you have anything to say? Ruth, Ruth just take you yourself off. Um, if you can just turn your mic. Thanks, Ruth. I'm, while I'm a, living in a regional centre now, I have lived in remote and rural areas, but I believe we need funding also for people in remote areas, especially who need to travel to appointments and travel to see their loved ones. And I'm very keen to see a council of the elders established, not only at national level, but at regional level, yes. so that we can all contribute to this council of elders, because I've been involved in it in the school parent movement when the children were younger and it worked. Yes. And so I'd, I'm hoping in my lifetime that we see the Council of Elders with regional contributions being made from yes. all regions in Australia. Yes, I agree, um, Ruth, that it would be great to see it at a local level so that it does feed mm. into that national level. And um, you'll get my vote if we come to that <laughs> at a local level. Well, it's all it's starting in a small way here in Bingo. It is. Mm. It is. Yeah. Um, Robin, did you want to say anything to that opening question? Yes, certainly I'd love to. Like Professor Ibrahim, I'm pretty glum, but 
in an ideal world or even a better world, I look at the Royal Commission report as something that, that's so comprehensive, it covers legislative, structural, economic and cultural changes that could bring about a transformation. I think the danger will be in cherry picking among the 148 recommendations and I'm pretty sure that government is inclined to do that and to see it as a whole. And I think then we can see a major improvement. Yes, yes. Uh, thanks, Robin. And I think, you know, Joe reflected that a little bit by saying that, you know, the Commission failed in interconnecting the different recommendations uh, in their final report. Uh, and I might just ask Karen, um, who's uh, from Code of Victoria, whether she had any comments to make to that opening question. Yes, so for me, it's a significant reduction in the waiting periods for home care, which would have a major impact on outcomes for older people, their carers and family, um, because older people need to get the home care that they need when they need it, so that they can remain in their homes as long as they're able. Currently, this is a major concern in the community that, that we come across an advocate project. People are quite shocked that there's long wait periods yes. and it's a standard expectation. Long wait times often contribute to the decline in health and abilities of people waiting for services, which in turn puts stress on the people, their families, their carers. So if someone is assessed as needing care to maintain their independence in the home, long wait periods have the opposite effect. And yes. personally, I have seen family members struggling to cope experiencing a decline in their health while waiting for assessed, for what they've been assessed and needs to be met. Um, and two family members were offered their packages as they went into residential care. Yeah, yeah. Um, so reducing waiting periods will lead to better outcomes for older people across all the aged care services because, you know, people can stay in their homes with the yes. support that they're entitled to. Yes. Yes, I agree. And I think that um, one of the things that, um, you know, that Judy referred to that joint um, consumer uh, peak organisation statement that came out uh, last week uh, talks about the waiting periods for um, home care packages and the enormity of it. And, you know, um, describes that, you know, in terms of people waiting, waiting for home care packages actually die while they're waiting for it. Yeah. And I think that's that's a tragedy that has to be addressed. Um, I might I might just um, now move to individual panel members and start with some questions. Uh, so um, Nick, to you first. Uh, one of the things that the uh, Royal Commission uh, stated very strongly is that the aged care system doesn't meet the needs of culturally and linguistically diverse populations, and it gave examples of. Uh, providers not pro um, providing culturally sensitive care. Coming from a Macedonian background, Nick, um, and from your own experiences, what do you think could be improved to meet the needs of older people from different cultures? Well, uh, I, I, um, I did note it this morning. Uh, as uh, uh, what uh, would make a difference in this area and uh, undoubtedly in my mind that language is a key to diversity and uh, well it can be according to what I have seen uh, people can find themselves in a place where uh, their language is not being understood uh, but, but to expect uh, the uh, the staff or the, the or, or, or or the carers to uh, know uh, uh, several languages is not easy. Uh, however, uh, I think that uh, at the point of uh, being uh, admitted to a particular age care. It should be one of the um, uh, questions at the top of the list that should be uh, asked 
and uh, people should be referred to uh, an, an appropriate facility where that particular need will be met. I think uh, uh, it, it might be a case where all too often that's not been uh, addressed. Yeah, yeah. And um, I think, you know, the thing with language, Nick, is certainly from my experience, is that um, that impacts on uh, the way people are treated culturally as well that if the issue of language is addressed, then the cultural sensitivities uh, for that particular person will be addressed as well. It, well, um, language is made up of culture. Yes. Uh, a lot of words uh, that, that are contained uh, in, in a language are from uh, uh, different happening, uh, historical events yes. that have uh, evolved in a particular country. So uh, it even uh, is related to how we, um, the meals that we, that we have. Yes. Um, and, 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 and of course, um, uh, the emotional attachment to family and, uh, uh, and, and, and friends. So yes. uh, without, without language, one can find themselves in a, in a very lonely corner. Yes, yeah, and it's a powerful catalyst for those things that you talked about, family and, you know, and uh, how we understand things and food and all of those things that encapsulate culture, the history. Well, and everything. Some, uh, Gary, uh, I, I, I have seen uh, several people in aged care that are very difficult to feed. Yes. They simply will not open their mouth. Yes. But if you talk to them, uh, and, and, and I was often asked to help with this because my mother was a fast eater and I had spare time and I could feed others that were near her in the dining room. Uh, so the carers would often come to me and say, could you please feed this one? So if I spoke to their own language, I, I could get them to open their mouth. Yes. Uh, I, I could touch them emotionally. Yes. Uh, and and that, that's been my experience, yeah. Yeah, great. Okay, thanks, Nick. Um, I might, might move to you now, Ruth. And um, in its report, the Commission expressed concern about access to aged care in rural and regional areas throughout Australia, citing that there was less availability of providers. And I saw this week, um, I think it was yesterday on the ABC website, that there's an article saying that uh, there is uh, a number of providers are pulling out from regional and rural Australia in terms of aged care. Some people might say that, well, why don't we just relocate people in need of residential aged care to the capital cities where there are more providers <laughs> and services? Some people might say that. So my question to you is, how important is it to provide services in regional and rural locations near where people live? And how well did the Commission address the needs of those living in those areas? It's very, as an older person, it is important to be where you've um, lived your years, but it's also important to be near your family. And yes. we have a number of people coming here to Bendigo facilities because the family live here. Now, I'm, I know that in the remote and rural areas, there's not the choice, but families do like to stay in the farming communities and uh, re residential care in rural and remote areas areas need specific financing to make sure that they don't have to close because they don't have the demand on their services. Yes, yes. And, and um, can you just sort of uh, talk a little bit about what your actions are of the Commission's uh, addressing the needs of people in rural and regional areas? Well, there needs to be specific funding for rural and uh, remote areas because Australia is a vast country. And, you know, let's think the services up in northwest Western Australia need to be looked at differently than yes. even here in Bendigo District, where we have some successful multi-purpose programs. 
programs that have been very um, successful in small towns like Inglewood and Rochester because it means that people can stay in the, the small towns of under a thousand people population. Yes, yes. And, I don't and, know if that answers your question. Well, but, it, it goes um, to part of it. I suppose that uh, one, of, one of the things that I did notice in the uh, recommendations or um, and particularly in that joint statement is that the there wasn't a sense that uh, aside from funding the recommendation for funding that there was really uh, that the commission had gone to addressing the needs of rural and regional people uh, in Australia. You're, you're, you're right Gary um, I had the opportunity to provide a speak when that commission was here in Bendigo on right. the complexity of the application process. Yes. Because that's what people, and um, when um, during lockdown in the September to end of November um, quarter, my stats, the figures are very low, but I helped 31 families and those 31 families needed 25 different plans Yes. Suggestions because each one was different. Yes. Yeah. And this has to be accommodated for because no, no one pair of shoes fits all of us. Yes. And no um, protocol fits every situation. And in rural and remote, it's even more important for the individual circumstances to be addressed. And if it takes more money, well, so be it. <laughs> yes, okay. All right, thanks, Ruth. Um, I now move on to you, Peter. Um, the Commission recognised the unmet needs of people with disability as they age, especially when the aged care system starts to intersect with the National Disability Insurance Scheme. In its final report, uh, it spoke of the lack of equity accessing health services. Growing older and living with a disability obviously adds further complexities. Is it really that hard? And has the Commission sufficiently addressed the needs of people living with a disability? Wow. Um, look, I'd obviously have to say no. Um, and my reasoning for that is that the people in the aged care sector are primarily there to provide care needs. They have very little experience of disability and the um, individual quirks of, uh, um, in my case, uh, I had polio as a child, and, but there are similarities with other conditions. There are similarities with some of our um, assistive technology or equipment that we need, but there are some very, very different things happening. Um, I think the best comparison I can draw to this, I've been a volunteer in aged care since my mother dragged me out of bed when I was 16 and said, you're going to do something. And I can remember in one of the uh, residences, there was a, uh, a younger person who had um, cerebral palsy and unable to communicate very well. The language was broken. Um, the poor girl was really left on her own. Um, I became sort of a friendly face that wa waved at her. But at no time had anyone told me that she was as intelligent as anyone else in the place, if not yes. more intelligent, had greater ability. Yes. Over the years, we've learned to acknowledge that people with cerebral palsy are incredibly intelligent and can do anything that anyone else can do. It's just that they can't verbalise it in the way that we can. Yes. Um, and I think that's a classic example of where um, uh, our aged care sector does not accommodate some of these individual needs, whether it's vision impairment, whether it's hearing, whether it's uh, um, a, 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 a lack of ability and, and mobility. And that, that's something that we need to address. And it needs to be addressed by small organisations that have that expertise. Yes. Uh, I've had a bit to do with the Motor Neurone Disease Association. They know exactly what they're doing. They know what the fourth, uh, forthcoming health conditions are going to be, and they are proactive. Um, years ago, there was a, a, several units, just about every health condition had a unit. Uh, the polio unit that used to operate at Park Street uh, in, in um, 
uh, since, since, since the South Yarra, right from the 1940s onwards, they had their own clinicians, they had their own ways of providing um, help to uh, the polio community. And that's why we've um, thrived under what was, you know, quite horrific conditions of, um, you know, in my case, I was in a stretcher bed for two years. So yes. it's not um, <laughs> that, that expertise does not sit in, in the aged care sector. Um, and as people age, um, we all have uh, loss of function, but many of us have um, other things that we're bringing to it, and that needs to be addressed individually. Um, and, you know, in the 71 years I've been alive, I've managed to negotiate all of the, the challenges of, of having lived with polio since I was four. I now live in a fully accessible wheelchair home. It's all set up. It's got its own wet rooms and wet bathrooms, the whole lot should have been needed. Um, I'm very fortunate and I'm really worried that under the modelling that's been suggested in this report for aged care is that something will go wrong, I'll become too expensive. And in spite of recommendation, whatever it was, 119, um, that uh, home care funding will be equal to the cost of what it would be at residential. I don't believe that's going to be going to happen. I'll be moved into a barely accessible uh, uh, room in, in residential care. My wheelchair will become a problem and it will be taken off me and I'll be put in a manual wheelchair where, again, that's another form of restraint. Yes. Because that's what we've been doing and that's what we know how to do well. Yes. And I think, yeah. as, as Nick said, um, the types of restraints that are used by chemical restraints, it's a cheap way of not understaffing. Yeah. And so, Peter, just, just from what you're saying there, it would be pretty critical then if, if, if the aged care uh, homes can't accommodate you, that you continue to receive uh, a level of funding which enables you to have care and an accessible home in place. Oh, it's a heck of a lot cheaper too. Yes. Aging yes. In place is what we need. Yes. Uh, Bruce spoke about people living in in, in, in their community. Yes. Um, you don't need a community of a thousand people to support you. A community of tens enough. Yes. Uh, as long as there is regular attention from our medical people, um, from the um, other tidying ups we've needed. Uh, uh, many of my friends under the current system. Uh, they're, 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 they're so underfunded that they're sleeping in their wheelchairs on the weekend because they can't afford to get a carer out of their, yes, their funding yes. to put them to bed on the weekend. So they just yes. sleep in the chair. This is inexcusable. Yeah. I think the great thing that's come out of this commission is that um, the public are becoming more aware of the cruelty that's gone on. And, you know, we, we really must keep that, that, that flame alight and, and make sure that we do something about it. Yes, yes, I agree, I agree. Um, Amanda, we might just flick to you now, and uh, maybe I, I, I've noticed that there's been a feed of comments coming in <laughs> in the chat, so obviously Definitely. people have become more comfortable about that. Are there any themes coming through or questions maybe for the panel? There was a lot of commentary from um, some of our attendees about the Council of the Elders um, wanting to start their own, but then commentary from others uh, wanting to contribute to the terms of reference, uh, particularly to gain an Indigenous um, perspective, which hasn't really been mentioned as much today. Um, there's uh, some people that are willing to um, offer to do a flowchart to prioritise the recommendations for the government. So um, perhaps that's something that we could consider doing, um, all 100 and whatever there are of them. Um, and then there's some comments starting to come in from our more recent speakers, um, particularly around uh, the need to change the aged care system to be a, a rehabilitative and restorative model rather than a medical model, with others commenting that, yes, um, this is what happens and people become institutionalised. Yes. Uh, then comments um, from Peter's comments um, uh, around needing to include visitors with disabilities so that... Um, there can be that like connection between people. And I probably yes. haven't read the last couple of comments, so I might have yes. that. <laughs> and um, I agree that um, one of the things that we haven't been able to do today in terms of the panel is have representatives from 
um, all of those groups uh, that have been mentioned, such as the LGBTIQ population and also um, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander population. Um, but I recognise that uh, the Commission has addressed some of those uh, populations in, in uh, their diversity section, and certainly the joint statement uh, talks about that. And I know that there is going to be a conference, I think, this weekend or the following weekend, an LGBTIQ conference, which is looking at uh, the issues of aged care, uh, particularly for older people of those populations. Um, all right, so um, thank you, Peter, and thank you, Amanda. Um, keep the comments coming in, please. Um, are we going to, Amanda, just if I can check with you, are we going to provide a summary of the comments at some point uh, in written form? Uh, yeah, we can uh, do it. We, we can do a copy of the um, comments to people and um, provide those to attendees. Um, Great, uh, after that's fantastic. The event. Yeah. You might need to give me till next week, though. <laughs> Okay. Okay, Karen, you talked a little bit about this at the beginning, um, but um, I'm wondering whether you could just tell us a little bit about the program uh, that you coordinate, which is the Code of Victoria's Aged Care Navigators Program, and then talk a little bit more about, from your experience and that of the volunteer navigators, what are some of the needs of people accessing aged care? Okay, so um, through the Aged Care Navigator Program, we assist older people, sometimes their families or carers, um, to navigate various aspects of the aged care system. Um, so we provide support through information sessions, face-to-face, -face, in individual contact, and also assistance on the line over and over the phone. Um, and in particular, over the last year, that was really important. As Ruth mentioned, she did quite a significant number in the Bendigo area and surrounding areas. The program involves work at a community level, often in partnership with other organisations, um, supported by different community representatives and a team of volunteers and navigators. Um, and this program has targeted specific locations for the trial period and taken initial inquiries through a phone line service, which referred through to our project. Um, so that's sort of the overview of how we've been working. Um, provision of very basic information about our, in my age care, you know, where people can start. Um, some people just don't know where to go to get help. So it's that initial stages um, through to dealing with more complex needs and addressing a far broader range of issues, uh, which often we might refer on to uh, other organisations. Um, we're also mentoring and supporting people over often a period of time as they work through the system. So there's several inch, you know, times that we might be coming back to support that person. Um, we try to provide some strategies to prepare them for their assessment of needs um, or what to consider, for example, with their financial aspects. And we're regularly working with some of the other associated services. Um, so the needs of people have, can be varied from those just wanting to understand the system. Some people are planning ahead as their needs are changing. Um, interstate relatives sometimes are trying to assist their families here in Victoria and especially over COVID restrictions. We had quite a few calls coming through where people were at a loss as how this, because they couldn't get to Victoria or um, they just had that really geographical ch challenges. Um, sometimes people who've had an initial assessment are lost in the system or they don't know what's next or where they can get some help. Um, also, people need access to printed resources as they don't have that online access, you know, online services, and they just need yeah. a hard copy of information that we're regularly handing out. Uh, there's people who are experiencing difficulties over the long wait periods and their needs have now changed and they, you know, so we're supporting them to 
help them to get a review. People who are daunted by the process of choosing a service provider is common. Um, you know, where do we go? Where do we start? They get massive lists of providers, don't know what questions to ask, don't know how to sift through to make that decision. And also some people simply need someone to discuss the whole process as they have no family or, you know, mm -hmm. family to support them. And we can often become a go-to place where they just need to have a chat. Am I doing the right thing? Is this where I need to go? Because that they are quite isolated in mm. trying to navigate the whole system. Mm. So that's just some examples of some of the support that we do provide. Mm. And, and uh, you know, I mean, some of the things you talked about, certainly um, people want the information in printed format, I think is uh, very common for me from uh, the work that I do as well that they like to have something to read and to uh, reference later, e even if they are using online um, tools, they still like to have that printed information. And I think that's really important and uh, needs to be included. Um, and and um, the other thing I think you talked about, which I think is really important, is that narrative of people who are alone, who don't have family, or don't have people close to them who can assist them or advocate for them in terms of uh, navigating the aged care system. And I think that's really important to recognise as well. So in, in, in the uh, thing you talked about mentoring, I'm just wondering, you know, in terms of that, if someone, one of the examples you gave is that sometimes a person's care needs will uh, change over the period that they've been waiting. So I'm... Can you just talk about how you actually manage that on, and mentor that person to um, advise, I suppose, that those changes have occurred? Um, so, well, firstly, you know, we've, have they spoken to my aged care? So some people sit at home just waiting, thinking it's all going to happen magically. Yes. It's encouraging people to be proactive and start by calling my aged care, find out where you're where you're at in the process. And um, just lately we had a session um, and we ended up, we had a, one of the assessment officers supporting us. And with that person, we sat down at the end and she actually, with the person's permission, looked up her file on My Age Care and she was caring for her husband and thought that he was getting services. Um, and then and that she was on a wait list, it turned out her, sus her husband had never been assessed and the right. services actually were linked to her and she'd been moved across in a big lump some when the whole system changed over um, and was not getting services she'd been approved for. So both of them actually needed a review. So it's trying to find out the start point for that person. Where do they go? Who do they talk to? Um, yeah. Because they can get lost along the way. And she was quite shocked, you know, that her husband wasn't even in the system. Yes, the, yes. So you just, you have to find out where the person's at and then take them on um, the right pathway. Sure. And so, um, Karen, if someone wanted to get in contact with you to be considered uh, to be, uh, you, you know, to be assisted in that uh, aged care navigation, how would they do that? Um, well, one main way is through our phone line service here at COTA, which is a 1300 1350 90. Yeah. And through that, um, our staff pick up those uh, inquiries. Yes. About, um, you know, somebody needing support and refer them through to us. Yes. Um, and sometimes there's other networks that we've established through some of our trials. Um, right. Ruth is our network in Bendigo, obviously. Um, yes. so it's a lot of word of mouth, but the 1300 line is a good start place. Okay, great. Thank you for that. And I'll, I'll just um, uh, say that number again. It's 1300 135 090. And the telephone number is in the chat if you didn't get it. And just a reminder that if any of this is distressing for you, that we do have a counsellor in attendance and you, her name is Janet, and you can contact her directly on 8470-1874.
Okay, I'll come to you now, Robin. Um, you're an aged care advocate. Why are you so personally invested in this issue? I see it as a human rights issue. Right. And my interest in aged care um, has been developed from a very young age. Um, as a student nurse, I love walk, working in the geriatric ward, unlike some of my peers. Um, it, it was an incredible experience to meet so many wise and lovely older people. Because, of course, in those days, I'm 75, so we're talking a long, long time ago, there weren't many aged care homes. So the geriatric ward was often where people ended yes, up. Yes, yes. Um, leaping right ahead, having worked in the community and health sectors and occasionally government, um, I've come into contact with aged care issues in many different roles. I drafted the ACT's first healthy ageing policy and it was quite apparent then when I was doing my research that government would need to face up to a, a rapid growth in the age population. Yes. And, and a decline in the dependency ratio. So my observation is that now we've reached a crisis in aged care mm -hmm. What have governments done to put things in place to manage it better? My greatest horror and shame came in a protracted work trip to rural and remote Indigenous communities and to see, particularly in a remote setting, how Aboriginal people who are old and don't happen to have families that are able to care for them well, are treated without access to almost any services, let alone poor services, mm -hmm. um, locked in compounds overnight. Um, that, that was the aged care system within those communities. And so I just think it's unjust Forget about a rights-based approach. We need a human rights approach to everything pertaining to ageing yes. and the need for care. And I guess that's what drives me. Great. And, and I noticed you said that you, um, you know, we were a part of um, formulating um, the healthy ageing policy. How's, how's that going for you individually? Sorry. Whether ageing is a healthy experience for me? Yes. <laughs> ageing's a very healthy experience for me, um, but at 75, I do realise that at some stage I will need access to care, whether that's provided by family or the system remains yes. to be seen. Yes. The one thing I don't want to do is age in a society that knows the price of everything but the value of nothing. Yes. And there's such enormous value um, that can be found in proper treatment of people as they age. Yes. So as an advocate, how has the Commission addressed some of your concerns and what do you think is missing? Whether it was the role or not of the Commission, I think the biggest missing link is the cultural change. What I find in my current advocacy role is that people, when you approach them, community members, younger people, um, even my grandsons, um, say, oh, yes, well, the poor old things have to be looked after properly. But when it comes to actually paying for that, it becomes a totally different response. Yes. And I think that the Royal Commission report needed to focus on cultural change more and how we can bring that about, how we can actually reduce or abolish ageism in our yes. society because it's very rife. Um, 
how to finance a grand new system which brings about a transformation in older people's lives yes um, hasn't been dealt with in enough detail i think even though the big picture is duly reported i think government will avoid that and there's already indication that that is going to happen yes in scott morrison's response uh, when he said oh well there'll be no levy i mean that was his only real direct response to the royal commission report yes that's very very disappointing yes i agree i think it's it is very disappointing and you know it goes against the grain of, of what you said at the beginning about price and value you know that uh he focused purely on the price and not the value which i think uh yes. is really important, uh, disappointing um, how do you think we'd go about getting the cultural change? Well, that's one of the things that I guess I focus on. Yeah. Um, it's not we poor old things. It's about being valued members of society as elders. I think other cultures get a, it a lot better where there's huge value placed on the wisdom and contribution of the elders. Aboriginal communities being one of them. Um, I think that it's our biggest job to, yes. to bring about a change in society's attitudes to ageing. It's not a horrible thing to do, age. It's a rather, rather lovely thing. I think we have to present much more positive images about ageing um, in the media. Um, Look at the media at the moment when it does bother to touch on the Aged Care Royal Commission, and that's another disappointing thing. The caravan yes. has moved on, and now we're all about vaccinations. Yes. Um, but we have to get much more positive images of ageing out there, and certainly that's what I try to do. Yes. Yeah. I, I think it is a challenge. I think that... Um, you know that uh, in terms of the work I do in elder abuse, the driver is ageism, and it's a challenge to uh, raise that and raise awareness to counteract that. Not only uh, amongst sort of young, the younger population or the middle aged population, but also for people who are getting older, um, because there is a lot of internalised ageism as well, and so that promotion of um, you know, ageing in a healthier way uh, really counteracts that uh, negative aspect of ageing that people might be hanging on to. One of the communities that I'm involved with is exercise classes at a council-owned leisure centre. Right. And I'd say that uh, probably 90% um, um, of the groups that I intermingle in um, are older people, some right into their 90s. Yes. And we have such fun and it's such a positive experience to, to be involved in that. Yes. And it's made me think, how do we change the narrative? Yes. And I'll say again, we have to promote the positiveness of ageing and the benefits. I love being retired. I love yeah. my work. Hell, <laughs> I love being retired. Um, and so far I'm very well, but I'll be ready um, yes. to deal with it if I'm not so well later on. Yes. I have a very supportive family, and that's yes. another key, I think, um, to promote the role of family um, as so many as Nick will tell you, because I do know Nick. Hi, Nick. Um, there are so many um, higher values in um, various ethnic communities towards their aged yes. um, family members. Yes. Okay. Um, I might just flick to Amanda um, just to give us the final comments. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to hand over to uh, Alexia and Amanda to do a roundup. 
Uh, bef just because um, I know we're sort of factoring in time here. Yep. Uh, so, Amanda, any comments or particular oh, themes lots. that are coming through? There's lots. I think, um, you know, we we might have all started out with a, um, a glum overview of, of what might have been occurring. But from that, you know, um, we are rallying, rallying um, lots of ideas in the chat and lots of encouragement from particular um, attendees. So thank you for your positive comments. Um, there's, a, there's a comment there uh, that the Navigators program uh, that Karen spoke about could be promoted in doctor's offices with flyers. Comments around um, that self-managed home care is not promoted by My Aged Care and some people who have switched to um, having a self-managed fund and think it's the best thing that they ever did because the providers can't take all the money for that administrative component. Comment from the Omni Group. Um, Code has got a, a old men's new ideas um, groups throughout Victoria and we're glad to have them along today that they are very involved in various groups to stay connected, active and out of residential aged care. Uh, comments around allied health being crucial, occupational health and, and others. Um, uh, encouragement for ground up, ground up action. Let's not be discouraged. Don't let the government off the hook. Don't let them replace a council of elders. The panel has given us some great examples and thank you very much. Um, a suggested book, The Aging, Aging Parent by Brian Hurd to help people to prepare, the younger generations to prepare. And that was a nice segue for people encouraging intergenerational bridges um, so, that, so that they realise we know a thing or two, but I, actually it goes both ways, doesn't it? It's just about yes. um, creating a, a broader understanding. Uh, comment around the older people home for four-year-olds being a good starting point. Um, some people think this is a huge challenge um, to tackle, that the system lacks respect for older people and that there is, it's more about the need to make money for providers. And I know that there's a lot of comments that have popped up. I can't read and um, yes. at the same time. So <laughs> feel free yeah. to add to that, Gary. Good on you. And um, thanks for summarising that, um, Amanda. It's obvious that people want to contribute to this discussion and uh, certainly Code of Victoria wants to hear from people at uh, different levels of the community as well. I'm going to, that's the, that concludes our panel discussion. Thank you to, uh, to Peter and Nick and Robin and Ruth and Karen for being courageous and being on the panel. I think it's always um, quite admirable to have people put their hands up and be on panels of this nature to stimulate discussion and to stimulate further action. And certainly that's what's happened as a result of today. And certainly it's reflected in the comments. I am going to hand over now to Alexia and Amanda and leave the forum. I would like to thank you all for participating. I think it's made for a very rich discussion. And I would particularly like to thank our uh, two keynote speakers at the beginning, Judy and Joe for contributing to the discussion as well. Thank you very much. And I'll now hand over to Amanda and Alexia. I'd, first of all, I'd just like to thank Gary for his job of moderating. It's not easy to do that kind of thing, especially when you're trying to do it remotely. So thanks very much for bringing it all together. I think we've had great speakers. And um, it's been great the way that you've um, facilitated that discussion as well. So thanks very much for that. Uh, I just wanted to give some sort of overall impressions from listening to the diversity of um, views this morning and reading the chat as we've gone along. I'd, I think we all come understanding that the aged care system is a very complex system and that we can't just focus on one particular bit of it and pick out a few actions from the Royal Commission recommendations and think that that will fix the situation. We have to continue to look at it holistically. But one of the things I thought was really useful today is to get a sense that we actually do have the resources as a country to, to fix and improve the system, to make it a system that is not only more respectful of people, but is a more empathetic system as well. And I think that's one of the things that really came across to me very strongly from the speakers and especially from the consumer panel is that 
we are looking at individuals and what they need from this system and we shouldn't lose that. We need to look at the needs of people, whether they come from different language groups, different cultures, from have disabilities, live in the country, live in the city, wherever they live, that it is really one of the most important things to us is that when we're talking about this, we can use big words like, you know, talking about the importance of transparency and accountability and governance. But underneath that, we have to create and maintain a system that is responsive to the needs of older people as they change and given their different circumstance. And we can't, I think that often is overlooked. We may see individual examples in the media of, um, you know, good or bad experiences of older people, but we have to actually entrench that within the system. And so we've heard a lot about the importance of empathy over the last few weeks in different contexts. But for me, this is really one where it is very important that we ensure that it, it, the changes we create, that one of the cultural changes we create is that respect of each person, each older person as an individual within this system. And to, in doing that, it's really important that we be aware, as Joe was mentioning, that we do have the resources as a country to do this, not just the money, but also the expertise, the expertise in relation to aged care, in relation to health, in relation to human rights, in relation to a lot of other things, if we choose to mobilise it to do this. And what we need to do for that is obviously the passion and I think we've seen today that there is actually a huge amount of passion amongst people around aged care, but it's how we mobilise that so that people like the government are aware that this is not just a report that can be put away somewhere, that it actually has is something that must be acted on and it must be acted on effectively. And that um, in order to do that, one of the things that we need to move away from is the, the reliance on the market mechanisms um, to control and ensure the quality of aged care to creating a stronger system, whether it's within the health department or as a, a standalone entity, that we actually need to, um, to ensure that the system itself ensures those safeguards, that it's not left to providers to do that. And when we see that um, there is not necessarily a sustainability plan within the recommendations of the Aged Care Royal Commission. That's true. And we have to look behind beyond just providing more and more money to providers. But another area that I think we need to be aware of that has been mentioned is that if we are going to have a stronger system, we do need a stronger workforce. And that's about training, but it's also about re remuneration of staff. Because if we want staff to be providing the kind of care we want to see, then part of their um, job satisfaction is about having a job that's, you know, pays them a sufficient salary. I think just a couple of other things that I'll mention. A lot, there's been a lot of talk and I was obviously a lot of interest in this whole idea of a council of elders. And I think that's something that we can provide a lot more support to that idea. And especially to ensure that that again, represents a diversity of older people. So it's not just a particular cohort that's invited to be involved in a mechanism like that. If it's really going to speak for the diverse, diversity of experience of older people. And uh, one of the things I particularly liked in the, um, the chat was people talking about that this should not just be a, a council of elders at a higher level engaging with government, but that there's much that we can all do at the neighbourhood and the community level in relation to aged care and our interaction, interaction with older people. And um, perhaps my one of my great takeaways from the day will be Robin talking about finding ageing as a rather lovely experience which I would share. And I think we all understand the mechanisms of ageism and the more that we can put, a for, put forward a positive view of ageing, I think the more that will help us in also then supporting the creation of a stronger, more responsive aged care system as well. So thank you to all of you. I think it's been a really en engaging day, but also for me, when we look at aged care, it's actually been quite an encouraging dis discussion as well. So thanks very much for that. I'll hand over to you, Amanda, for the last bit. And just 
another thank you before I hand over to Amanda. Amanda has done a huge amount of work in organising this, and so thank you very much to you for having the original idea and carrying it through. It's been a great experience. Thank you. Thanks, Alexia. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Um, well, the idea being that we never, ever give up, right? <laughs> so um, in some ways, this might feel like the end of the road now that the Royal Commission has concluded, which Joe's just been making comment um, on in the chat, but it's not. It's really the start of another journey. The Royal Commission has handed down some powerful recommendations to the Australian government, but the challenge, as we have heard today, is getting the government to start implementing them, and that's no easy task. Since aged care is predominantly a federal issue, CODA Australia, which is like the federal counterpart of the organisation CODA Victoria that we belong, that we work for and that some of you are members of or, or connected to, they're um, doing the bulk of the work about this at that, that federal level. And at the moment, they're focused on um, the federal budget, which is due to be handed down on the 11th of May. If you'd like to explore more about their advocacy actions, please head to CODA Victoria's um, Royal Commission Aged Care web page on our Code of Victoria website and it's got all the links to that um, the 12 uh, uh, providers um, information that Judy spoke about earlier and other um, their media release and other things that is their points of view that you can use in what I'm going to suggest you do next. Um, and at Code of Victoria, what we're doing is that we're um, taking um, some of our concerns around the role of the state government because they're not, um, not involved in this space just because most of the funding around um, aged care comes from a federal level. So we've already been lobbying um, through our CEO, Tina Hogarth-Clark and um, other workers for them to prioritise three top uh, issues at the moment, and we'll probably un, un, um, furl some more, improving access to AIDS equipment and assistive technology, improving access to state-based healthcare services for people receiving aged care, and improving the transfers between hospitals and residential care. So that leads us to you guys and girls. Um, now we want to focus on how you can influence change. We, we know that we need to show the government that there is strong demand for change and that older people will not be silenced until the recommendations have been properly implemented. We need to show them that older people have waited long enough and the time to fix aged care is now. No matter what your relationship with aged care, your voice is important and we encourage you to use it. You can do your part by helping to contact your uh, local MP and demanding um, that they do something more about aged care, not just the ones in government, but the ones in opposition as well. You can write letters to your local newspaper or radio station, outlining the, the need for the Royal Commission recommendations to be swiftly implemented. If you aren't sure to, where to start, then that's okay. Code of Victoria, um, with a lot of help from my wonderful colleague, Lauren Hen Henley, has developed some resources to help you along the way. Our Advocacy Warriors Toolkit includes a number of useful tools to help you. There's a sample letter to MPs that you can adapt for your personal use. There's guidance around how to approach a meeting with your MP. There's guidance about how to write a letter to the editor um, and a sample letter to the editor. So feel free to, um, to steal those resources and adapt them for your own use um, and, and hopefully guide you. The, the link to this has been provided by Lynette in the chat, but it'll also be provided to you in a follow-up email this afternoon, which will include um, a survey to feedback, to give us feedback about the event, but also the links to the toolbox so that you can use those resources. They're free. Feel free to share them. You know, if we all connected with a few other older people or younger people or your grandchildren, then, you know, we can fix this system. So... Um, just a reminder that if anyone is feeling distressed as a result of today's conversation, please make sure that you reach out and speak to someone. We, have grateful, we are grateful to have had the participation of Janet Nixon from Your Community Health here today to provide support. But if you'd like to follow up with Janet, you can make an appointment with her via Your Community Health on 03 8470 1111. Alternatively, you can contact Lifeline or Beyond Blue, and those numbers are in the chat line now. Um, 
So we're just about to end today's session, but before we wrap up, I'd like to extend a huge thank you to everyone who has been involved in today's event. To our CEO, Tina, and our Zoom guru, Lynette, thank you. To our guest presenters, Judy Gregorki and Joe Ibrahim, your insights um, and guidance have been somewhat glum, but helpful. We needed the reality check to stir us to action. Uh, to our consumer panelists, Nick Nicolau, Robin Vogt, Peter Wilcock, Karen Ivanka and Ruth Hosking. Wilcock, sorry, Peter, got your name wrong again. Um, I'll get it right in the end. Thank you. I, I think we all agree and we'll give a big round of applause um, that the insights from those consumers have been so valuable to this conversation. Um, to my colleagues, Alexia Huxley, um, who is now... Uh, got considerable rap talents, and to the help from my other colleagues, Gemma Neve, Gemma Paprel, Kirsty Chalmers, Lisbeth Gonzalez, Nanjaro, and Ron Berg, and of course, to our amazing facilitator, Gary Ferguson. And finally, to all of you for coming along, and even to the people that have left, we would like to thank each and every one of you um, for your commitment, for your interest, and for your involvement. We hope you've enjoyed the event. Um, we hope that you feel a little bit more informed and a little bit more inspired to take action. It's, it's our aged care system, it belongs to all of us. So let's hope that we can do something about it. Um, and you know, I'm sure that we'll probably try and help people connect and do something together as well. So thank you for participating. I'd like to sign off with a comment that was from one of our um, participants from the 2019 consumer work that we did. And this is from Valerie at one of our Melbourne-based workshops. We ran nine throughout the state. We're seeking to change the culture of ageing in Australia, but sadly older people here are seen as a burden. We don't value their skills and what they can contribute. We use the word decline. This contributes to an aged care system that doesn't consider quality of life. Yes, we're encouraged to live a long time, as long as we don't get old. Well, Valerie, let's hope that we've changed the minds of people here today and beyond um, because we want to celebrate ageing, fix our age care system and celebrate all of us growing older. Thank you, everyone, and have a happy day. Goodbye. <laughs>